Live from the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Q at Oracle Open World 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor QLogic with support from HGST, Violin Memory, and Mark Logic. And now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. Welcome back to San Francisco, everybody. It's good to be in San Francisco. I'm here with Jeff Kelly, and uh, this is Oracle Open World. This is our fifth year here at Oracle Open World. SiliconANGLE, Wikibon's theCUBE, our live mobile studio. We, we go out to the events. We extract the signal from the noise. We're going to talk to Mark Logic. David Gourbet is here. He's the VP of Engineering at Mark Logic. Mark Logic is a company that, according to Wikibon, is one of the leaders in big data. Jeff Kelly could talk more about that. David, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, my pleasure to be here. So Oracle Open World, big show, a lot of customers here. We're talking off camera, a lot of your customers here. And um, so what do you think this year, 60,000 people, it gets bigger every year, they take over, Moss take over San Francisco, essentially. <laughs> um, it's, it's getting somewhat out of control, but it's good. A lot of business being done here, a lot of action. So what's your take on the show so far? Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, it's great to see so many people. It's great to see uh, so many different uh, vendors and so much different, um, new things going on in the database world, right? Because for a long time, there wasn't really a lot going on, but it's a very exciting market to be in Yeah, now. database was kind of boring for a while. People say, oh, you work in the database business, okay, great. And then, now all of a sudden it's exploded. Yeah, yeah. And you're seeing you know, key value stores and all this NoSQL talk and SQL on Hadoop and you know, real time and just exciting. So where's MarkLogic fit into all that? Yeah, so we're, we're a NoSQL database, but we are the enterprise NoSQL database. So if you think about, a lot of the NoSQL technologies, which as you know are, are technologies that were designed to accommodate the type of data that doesn't fit easily in relational and rows and, and columns. Um, you know, a lot of those NoSQL technologies grew up around uh, single application web use cases. So I'm building a, you know, Facebook or something like that. Um, our uh, focus, and we've been around for 14 years now, our focus has always been on the enterprise. Um, so giving customers the enterprise capabilities that they need uh, high availability, disaster recovery, security, uh, journal archiving, and, and just transactional integrity, which a lot of NoSQL technologies are missing. So when the big data meme really sort of took off, and you guys were doing big data before, it was called big data. That's right. Um, but a lot of the practitioners that I've talked to, when you talk about no, no schema on write, they go, what? <laughs> how did you get through that in the early days? Um, and, and how was that sort of, how do you deal with that with customers? Well, you know, there's always been uh, complex data out there. Um, there's always been data out there that's not in a relational database because it's too hard to model. Um, and that data is valuable. And it, depending on the industry, um, in some cases it is the entire value of their business. So, you know, we are early, some of our earlier customers were publishers. They were creating information applications. Um, content is very hard to model in relational databases. Uh, and so they saw the value right away and they had to transform their industry. But now we're seeing more and more um, companies or customers uh, who have complex data, uh, financial services customers, derivatives contracts, very complex. Healthcare records are very complex. These are actually not unstructured data. They're structured, but the structure is complex, hierarchical. Uh, it would be very sparse in a relational database. It's very hard to model. Um, and you couple that with the dynamic nature of most businesses today, the agility that they need in being able to model new forms of data and do new things with it, um, it's just, you know, it's very hard to do in the relational world. Can you talk a little bit about your approach, your philosophy? We're at Oracle Open World, so it'd be good to, to differentiate from Oracle if you could. I mean, you got, you know, multi-million dollar boxes, you got hardware and software engineered together, mm -hmm. Exalytics, Exalogic. Big iron. Yeah, um, yeah, it's like the mainframe all over again. Yeah, you guys don't make hardware, <laughs> I don't no, think. No, we don't. Um, so how is your philosophy different you know, as, a, as an engineer? How do you approach the problem differently? Well, one of the, I mean, there's several differences, really. One of the key things is that in today's data environment, there's a lot of data, a lot more than, you know, and, and more being created every day. And that data, not only is there a huge volume of it, but there's a lot of different types of data that people want to model. Um, so our approach really is um, to use a, a scale-out architecture, which is more typical of NoSQL than of a relational database, right? so that you can add new um, capacity on commodity hardware. It's much more cloud capable, so we've heard a lot about cloud here at Oracle Open World, right? So, but you know, our technology is fundamentally designed that way, right? so it's a scale-out architecture. Uh, but it's also the schema agnostic nature of our database allows you to integrate new data easily and quickly, right? So that if you have, it's not just about the volume, it's about I want to suddenly start analyzing some new piece of data along with my existing data 
um, I can do that without having to do a, a six month or a year long data modeling exercise. So, I mean, I had a little tongue in cheek earlier today, we were talking on theCUBE, it was 8i for internet, and then mm -hmm. 11G for grid, oh, what, G became C for cloud. <laughs> so you're, I'm inferring from your comments, you were sort of born in the cloud, um, you know, born in this new platform well, world. Uh, talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so we, you know, our founder came from a search background. Um, and so he's, you know, internet generation technology where um, it scale out is the model. Um, and the way that you index for that type of technology is fundamentally different than the way that you index for a traditional relational database. And it allows you to do more with the, with the data. It allows you to answer questions uh, that you never thought you were going to ask. So you don't need to figure out, not only do you not need to model all the data in advance, but you don't also need to figure out all the questions and all the queries you're going to have to do so that you can do index optimization, right? So it's a, yes, uh, it was born uh, of the sort of the new generation of uh, data modeling with a search-based internet style paradigm, but focused on enterprise data and enterprise customer use cases. And that's kind of the definition of enterprise big data. Jeff, you remember when we went back into probably 2009, 2010, we were trying to define it. It was doing things that you couldn't do with traditional technologies, and that was sort of how we came about the, our definitions, right? Sure, and then, you know, I think when we, early days, we talked, a lot, talked about a lot of those things you couldn't do with traditional systems, and then the conversation we've seen shifting towards the enterprise grade components. Well, we want to do these new things that you couldn't do with a traditional relational system or a traditional data warehouse, but guess what? We also need all that enterprise grade, security, high availability, um, you know, the privacy uh, implications. Yeah. So we're starting to see that become much more of a conversation, and, and so, so suddenly we're seeing um, the conversation started to swing in, in Mark Logic's direction because yeah. you've been focused on that for a while. Take us back a little bit. Um, so the company's been around since kind of even before the whole NoSQL no revolution, if you will. Um, so, so take us back there a little bit if you can. Um, what, was, what did Mark Logic see that was so far ahead of the market that you know, the market seems to have caught, started to catch on a few years ago, but you guys were way, way ahead in 2001. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it starts with our founder who, like I said before, came from a search background. He was the principal architect at InfoSeq. Mm -hmm. um, and he just thought it was crazy that you could find stuff on the internet so easily and quickly, but you couldn't find stuff in your own organization, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so he set out to make, to unlock the value of that data, to make it available. Um, and then he very quickly realized that in order to do that, you have to think about how you're going to store it in a different way. You need a database and a search technology to be together. The way I like to think about it is the, um, search is the query language for unstructured data. And if you have complex data that's a mix of structured and unstructured data, you, know, you need to be able to mix query and search seamlessly, right? But the enterprise customers with their enterprise data, you know, they always needed transactional integrity. They need you know, acid transactions. And in, in case you're wondering, acid transactions is not just about you know, bank debits and bank credits. I mean, it's, it's about a consistent view of your data at all times. Uh, you, know, you can't even back up a database you know, with a consistent backup, if you don't have a con guaranteed consistency in your database, you know, you have to quiesce it, stop ingesting things, get it to a consistent state. Mm -hmm. You know, our enterprise customers can't afford to do that, right? So at the end of the day, they're looking for that agility and flexibility with their data, um, but they need, there's this thing called data governance, right? They need to be able to, they need to be able to manage their data, they need to be able to run it in their data center. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of these technologies just are not really uh, enterprise ready. So tell us about how you approach that issue in particular around some of these use cases you were talking about earlier. Almost like, it sounds like the data warehouse use case, but with the added flexibility that a NoSQL database provides. Um, talk about that use case and where those privacy implications come in, the data governance issues, and how you're able to address those in ways that maybe, especially when you've got a lot of data sources, you're moving them around, in ways that it was maybe harder in the kind of old world of the yeah. traditional data warehouse to do that. Well, one of the things that makes it hard is that there's so many different technologies operating on the same data, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got, if you've got uh, data that you're generating in your business, you've got your transaction processing data, you have a, a system for that. And then if you want to analyze that, then you're going to go ETL that into some data warehouse somewhere, which is a totally different technology stack, right? So not only is it difficult from a data modeling perspective and from an ETL perspective, but from a governance perspective, these systems use different security models, they have different scale models, um, you know, they, there's different retention and lifecycle features on both of them. Um, so it makes it very hard, and the more of those you have, uh, the more difficult it is in your data center. So what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, a lot of customers want to simplify that. Right? They want to be able to, do, to use a set of technologies 
that has a similar, a same sort of uh, scaling pattern, the same security model, and to be able to leverage it throughout the data lifecycle from the transactional, uh, you know, um, live portion of it where you're actually processing transactions through to sort of a, maybe a compliance portion where you're keeping it around to answer compliance queries, but it's really read only at that point, through to the archive portion where you know, you're not putting stuff on tape anymore, you want to put it in maybe HDFS, a distributed file system, so that you can do you know, MapReduce jobs on it and figure out you know, what trends are happening long term in your, in your business. Being able to do all of that with a single database technology vastly simplifies the governance problem because you're not transforming the data at every step. You can use the same security model, the same scale model, um, the same data retention model, et cetera. So, so same, if I can jump in, so, so same, same policies and, and you, it makes it easier to automate. And ISVs can build on top of that, presumably. I, I, so when I think about, you were just describing the, the, the data life cycle, uh, I think about at some point, I know a lot of people want to keep everything, but I know a lot of general counsels don't want to keep everything. Right. So how does that fit in? Um, to your model, uh, again, it's, it's not your primary value proposition, but presumably ISVs can add value on, on top of that. Can you yeah, talk about that we actually bit? have several ISVs who have built solutions on top of MarkLogic, mm -hmm. uh, one in particular in the e-discovery space, right? Because if you think about it, you know, being able to you know, get lots of different information from lots of different places together very quickly and then be able to search and, uh, and discover what's in there, that's a, a key use case for that. Um, but for compliance, I mean, one of the things that makes compliance difficult is when you decide you have to retain something or when you decide you have to delete something, you know, maybe there's a privacy law that requires you to delete a, a customer record or something if they request it. Um, if you have all these different systems that are ETL'd together with lots of dis different downstream, you know, data flowing downstream and then, you know, people doing desktop aggregation, you lose control of the data and you don't even really necessarily know where it is. Being able to have a more data-centric viewpoint you know, with a, a technology stack that supports all of that, uh, makes it much, much easier to control the data. Can you talk more about your technology stack? I mean, we touched on search a little bit, it obviously fits in there, but talk about the stack in particular. Yeah, so, you know, we're a database, um, so we are at the persistence layer of your stack. Typical architectures are, a, you know, a three-tier architecture. Uh, we're the database layer. Um, like every database, we have a file system that we use to store data. Unlike most databases, we can work on almost any file system. So we can work on you know, SAN or NAS. We can work on local disk, like many NoSQL scalar technologies. Mm -hmm. We can also run directly on HDFS. Um, so if you're using Hadoop, um, you can run your data directly on the HDFS file system um, and do MapReduce jobs right underneath uh, MarkLogic, use MarkLogic to do real-time query as well. Um, and then on top of that, we have interfaces that allow you to access your data through REST, through an OD ODBC driver, if you can believe it, right? SQL in a NoSQL database. Um, you know, through uh, Java clients or, or other middle tier clients. So it's interesting, it's interesting to hear you talk because Jeff, as you know, a lot of times competitors of MarkLogic will say, wow, well, they were born before Hadoop and so they're not, they're not modern, they're not, you know what I'm talking <laughs> about. Everything you're saying fits into this sort of big data world, this born in what I'm calling born in big data, born in the, the cloud world. Is that an unfair criticism? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, we, we have a, um, you know, we, we look at all these technologies as they come out. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep a very close eye on the Hadoop ecosystem, for example. There's a lot of valuable technology there, right? So, you know, HDFS is a valuable technology. MapReduce is a valuable technology. There's also a lot of churn in that ecosystem as well. People trying to layer on security, people trying to layer on transactions, people sure. trying to layer on in indexing. For us, we already have all that stuff, right? So being able to just run directly on top of Hadoop and put you know, all of the data management capabilities at a, with enterprise grade on top of it, it's just a natural fit. So are we trying to put, is the ecosystem trying to push, or the industry trying to push, make Hadoop do things that it, that it shouldn't do? I mean, I know the security people would say, well, security has to be designed in. You yeah. can't do it as a bolt-on. You could say the same thing about high volume transaction processing. You could say the same thing about a lot of things. So, so you guys started with that in mind. That's right, yeah. What's your opinion of that as yeah. an engineer? It's very hard to do that as a bolt-on. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, when we started, we started with, there are certain things that you say, we're not going to compromise on. We're not going to compromise on transactional integrity. We're not going to compromise on security. And then you design around that. Right? And so our design has evolved around the things that we decided we were not going to compromise on that enterprises need. Um, if you didn't design around that, it's much, much harder later on to go and retrofit. Um, and so we're seeing a little bit of that with the Hadoop ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I think the, the you know, HDFS and MapReduce were designed to solve a big data problem. Almost everything else in the Hadoop ecosystem were designed to solve problems with HDFS and MapReduce. 
You know what <laughs> I mean? So it's, it's like, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of that. And that's not to say they're bad technologies. I mean, I think there's a lot of good innovation going on there. Um, but I think it's going to take a long time for all that to coalesce into something um, that's really sort of enterprise grade. Mm. So, so I, I want to go back a little bit to the, kind of you laid out the life cycle, the kind of get the transaction, live transactions, uh, doing some of the analytics, as well as the archiving, all using MarkLogic kind of as a database layer on top. Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you put a little color on that? Maybe talk about a customer or two. What kind of applications are they running where they're doing both the live transactions, also bringing in the analytics so they can analyze that mm -hmm. data in close to real time. Yeah. And maybe, you know, if you've, if you've got a Hadoop example, that's great too. Yeah, so a good example is fraud analytics, right? So if you've got, if you're an investment bank and you're doing uh, transactions, and you're using, you know, uh, MarkLogic is used to process, for example, derivatives trades. Mm -hmm. um, and then you want to be able to look at those patterns and figure out, you know, is there a rogue trader or is there some fraud going on or something like that. Being able to do that three days later is not useful. Right, you want to be able to do that as close to real time as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example. Um, another example is, is just with the, um, the whole healthcare.gov marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so they're doing a lot of transactions. Um, they're also doing analytics on those transactions to figure out uh, you know, who, who is in what segment and who's applying for which, um, which policies and things like that. And they want to be able to do those analytics on the same data set without mm -hmm. having to do ETL. So traditionally, if you were, even if you were, traditionally, maybe not the right word, even if you're doing that kind, those kind of workloads with a different NoSQL database, you would be, you would, you could run those transactions, and then you would have to move that data at some point into a into an analytic environment. That's right. Um, because we're hearing a lot about some of the NoSQL database having some of the challenges are right around exactly what we're talking about: BI and analytics against that data. And then we're not even talking about real-time mm -hmm. capabilities. Um, so to get that real-time view would be very challenging in some of these other environments. Yeah, yeah, and and our technology is designed for that. So that you know we design. In order to do the transactional piece, you need to have transactions, right? So having acid transactions is important, uh, but it's more than just acid transactions. I mean, we do memory buffered writes, we do lock-free reads, so that you can get high volume uh, mixed query workloads. So we do a lot to be a really great, fast transactional database. But the way we index, so our indexing technology allows you to answer um, just any arbitrary question on your data um, to do more sort of discovery-based analytics. Um, and so, you know, being able to have those indexes and be able to give you sub-second response on very complex queries and also having the transactions in the same database um, makes it easy to do both of those things. So, you know, I like to say, you know, if you think about it, why is Google so fast? You go type something into Google, you know, why, is, why do they give you the results so fast? It's because they're not actually searching the web. They're searching their indexes. Right, so we do the same thing. We have indexes of everything that's in the database, and we we can return sub-second response on very very complex queries, analytic queries, uh, and this is the way that that business intelligence and analytics in general is going. It's going to become a more um, search-based operational paradigm. It's not sufficient anymore just to say I'm going to pre-compute all my dimensions and I'm going to figure out what my dashboard is going to look like and I'm going to create some canned reports. Right, I want to be able to ask a question of the data. And then based on the answer to that question, ask a different question that I hadn't thought I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. It's about discovery-based analytics. And so we think about um, Gartner recently re uh, released a report on data warehouse, and they're separating that into four different categories now. There's traditional data warehouses, mm -hmm. and then there's you know, a category of operational data warehouses, where you know, I have to say MarkLogic is number one on that. <laughs> so, um, well, it's, it, there are definitely different use cases, and uh, it, it's interesting when you think about, you know, that when you think about real time, you know, the definition of that is relative, depending on yeah. your particular use case. But the idea, that you, the example you gave is a great one. When you see a rogue trader, it's no good to figure that out three days later when that rogue trader is off in the Bahamas somewhere, <laughs> uh, you know, enjoying his, uh, the fruits of his labor. So, um, so I got to push you a little bit though, from, from a technology standpoint, everything sounds fantastic, but there's, there's got to be some trade-offs. Are there any trade-offs you've had to make from an engineering perspective um, that you wish you could or, or you are working on kind of filling in some of those gaps. Yeah, yeah, so there's always trade-offs uh, to make. Uh, for example, if you do um, journaling, then it takes longer than if you don't do journaling. So when you're journaling transactions. Uh, that's the trade-off that you make for durability, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, you do, if you have a scale-out system and you want to have transactions across multiple different entities in your database, you need to have some sort of two-phase commit system, mm -hmm. right? That takes a little bit longer. That's a trade-off that you make to have asset transactions. Mm -hmm. We also do a lot of indexing up front. Um, that's a trade-off that you make in order to be able to respond to complex queries in sub-second time, right? So we think those are the right trade-offs because what we see is we see people building those into their application layer if they don't have them in their data layer, 
Mm -hmm. And it's more efficient to do those in the data layer, right? So security is another good example, right? If you built security in, yes, there's a trade-off because we index security properties on the documents and it takes you know, a few extra nanoseconds when you're ingesting mm -hmm. data. Uh, but if you don't do that, then you're going to spend a lot of time in your application doing this. So there are, there's, there are some performance trade-offs. How do you, as a, um, as a company or as an engineer, what are you, what, I think Dave asked a similar question earlier, but I just want to ask it again about what are, what are your, what's your philosophy about where do we make those trade-offs? How do you look at a, you know, when you're developing the database, you're developing new capabilities, where do you say, okay, this is something where it's worth taking a slight performance hit yeah. because this is quote unquote enterprise grade capability that people need yeah, so, or some other. Yeah, uh, so we won't compromise quality. on things like security, on things like transactional integrity. Um, it's, a, it's a false economy. Uh, because if you if you lose all your data because a node goes down or something like that, then it doesn't matter how fast you got the data in there in the first place, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but you know that said, we have a scale out architecture, mm -hmm. so you know it's very easy to to achieve whatever load performance or whatever query performance you need uh, mm -hmm. by adding scale. And we actually have an elastic uh, model where you can scale up and scale back down again, which is equally important. Mm -hmm. um, you know as your data needs change. So for example, we have a customer. Um, who they, uh, they know that they're, um, I think it's the middle of the week is the busiest period, weekends are not busy at all, mm -hmm. they're on the Amazon cloud, um, they preemptively scale up their architecture for their midweek rush, mm -hmm. they scale it back down again on the weekend mm -hmm. because they know they don't need that capacity, mm -hmm. right? So, got you. So that that's an interesting um, example. So you mentioned the cloud. What are you, are you seeing a lot of traction there? What's the? Oh yeah. What talk a little bit about the uh, the role you think the cloud's going to play? Maybe now, but also going forward. Um, we're here at Oracle Open World Cloud's every other word you hear. Um, and, but of course, you know we've been covering this market. Dave's been writing a lot about cloud and the economics of cloud. Yeah. Um, how do you see this playing out in terms of the database world specifically? Well, so for, you know, uh, cloud technologies and being able to scale uh, elastically has always been there at the application tier, right? Where you have mm -hmm. a stateless app server or something like that. It's very hard to do at the, at the data tier. Mm -hmm. um, and it's particularly hard for relational databases. So you know, we have a bit of a different philosophy from Oracle with respect to the cloud. We think the cloud is about agility. We don't think it's just about taking my application that I wrote and moving it to some other hosting provider, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we think it's about having choices so that you can be agile about expanding and, and contracting your environment mm -hmm. so that you can build new applications on top of your existing data. Uh, being able to run in a hybrid environment where some of it is on-premises and some of it is in the cloud, we have some customers doing that as well. Um, and for us, agility, you know, if you think about what MarkLogic is all about, it's about agility with your data. It's about being able to do things without having to do the data modeling up front, without having to build you know, rigid ETL. Mm -hmm. The cloud is a natural extension of that for us. It's, it's really part of our, it's an extension of our value proposition, really. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, good. Sorry. I was going to say, being able to do that at the, at the database tier just adds a lot of flexibility to the infrastructure that has never been there before. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example? I mean, you've been around for a while. Uh, Jeff, as I said, Kelly's report, I think shows you, I think Jeff, I'm correct, and Mark Logic's the largest independent sort of big data company, right? And it's certainly right. leading in the NoSQL uh, space. And, uh, okay, uh, in, your, in your data. Can you give us an example of uh, a, a, a customer who's doing something with Mark Logic that they couldn't do before, or maybe change their business? You know, what's your favorite customer example <laughs> in that sort of general category? That's a hard question because there are so many, really. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, there's, uh, it goes ev everywhere from customers who have you know, gone from 16 different database systems to one MarkLogic system mm -hmm. and vastly simplified their infrastructure, uh, to customers like the, the FAA, for example, who runs their emergency operations network on MarkLogic. You know, this is a situational. Oh, I hope that thing's good then. That's good. That yeah. better be solid. Enterprise class, right? <laughs> this is a situational awareness application. Yep, right. So if there's a hurricane or something and they need to figure out where to land mm -hmm. planes or where to reroute them, they can do that. And the types of data feeds that they ingest in order to do that are you know, geospatial location data for, for planes, um, metadata about airports, because it turns out a 777 can't land at every airport, you know, right. certain runways can't accommodate them, uh, you know, what fuel stocks are available so they can make sure that they can refuel and get out of there, uh, weather data, obviously weather data, but also um, you know, Twitter feeds they're monitoring now as well, because since the miracle on the Hudson, you know, they've been, you know, they're monitoring aviation related tweets in case that, that may be the first place that they learn about some aviation disaster. Mm. Uh, being able to con combine all that data into one system and then build a situational awareness application on that, I, I like that one, frankly. Yeah, when that's fly, pretty exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. But my follow-up <laughs> question was, was, what's, you know, what kind of, from a technology standpoint, what's exciting you? That, that example you just gave is pretty exciting, but there, are there any others that are really sort of 
yeah, I mean, you. So I run engineering in our project. So for me, I'm always looking forward, right? So right. I'm thinking about what's coming next. And we have some incredible technology coming out soon in the next couple of months. Um, that's just going to really revolutionize um, the, the database world. So things like you know, our bitemporal capability, which is going to be really important for anybody who's in a compliance type situation. It allows you to answer the question, you know, what did we know about a time period in the past when we made a decision versus what we know about that time period now? Right? So you need to be able to ask those questions so that you can justify decisions that you made, um, so that you can, um, you, know, uh, allow, you can follow the train of decisions across corrections in your data. Um, it's going to be very important in the financial industry, but also uh, it's very popular in, in all kinds of other industries oh, as well. I'll bet, that's well, exciting. Yeah. And um, you guys got an event uh, that we're going to be at, I think next uh, in the spring, uh, right? in April. In April, yeah, our yeah. Logic World user conference. That's going to be that's great. Right. So we'll see some of those innovations there as well. That's right. Excellent. All right, David, listen, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE, sharing the story of Mark Logic. Congratulations on all the success and uh, hot company, and we'll be watching, you know, rock star CEO. And, uh, yeah, that's true. And uh, really excited to, to, to watch how this all shakes out. Um, we've got a capital markets event uh, down in, uh, in New York, and uh, we're going to be talking about these issues, the disruption that is big data on the traditional enterprise. So, uh, and I know you guys are part of that as well. So thanks very much for all the support and thanks for coming to theCUBE. Great, thanks for having me, it's been great. All right, thank you. All right, keep it right there everybody. Jeff Kelly and I will be back to wrap up at Oracle Open World right after this. This is theCUBE, we're live from Moscone.